Hello and welcome to another episode of Darwin Investors. Man, we have a huge week ahead. It's actually a week that I've been looking forward to for about a month or so because it could dictate how I'm going to play this market for about the next six months. And the reason why it's going to be so big is we've got this inflation read that comes out on Tuesday. And as we know, the, uh, these inflation reads is what's driving this market, you know, up and down. That and that and uh, federal fund rate hikes and stuff like that. And it just so happens the day after this inflation print, uh, Jerome Powell is going to announce, it's expected he's going to announce a 50 basis point hike to the federal funds rate. And I don't know what it is about his announcements, but then whenever he makes these announcements, it always seems to have kind of a positive impact on the market. So this week we'll be looking back at the PPI or the producer price index, and that's going to kind of give us a window into what the CPI should look like this Tuesday. We're going to try and predict this number. I'm going to be using some math, kind of bring your thinking hats along. It's not going to be very difficult math, but using the PPI print we're going to, and, and past CPI prints, we're going to try and project what we believe the inflation rate will be come this Tuesday. And after that, um, I'll weigh in on whether or not I believe a Powell recession is on the way. Um, you know, you turn on CNBC and everyone's got their opinion about this. You know, are we in a recession? Are we headed for a recession? It's going to be a soft landing. It's going to be a hard landing. I'll go ahead and give you my opinion. And then based on this recession uh, forecast, that's exactly how I'm going to be playing my portfolio for about the next six to 12 months. And then finally, I'll show you my options portfolio from last week and show you how I did. And then I'll let you know if Lululemon did me dirty at all and I'm not sure what it is about Lulu but no matter what happens I just can't seem to stay mad at her and finally at the very very end I'll be giving you a word from my sponsor so stay tuned and let's get into this so yesterday the PPI came out and it came with these scary headlines like wholesale prices rose 0.3 percent November more than expected despite hopes that inflation is cooling and at, in pre-market the the stock market was up about 100 points or so on the Dow about 100 150 points and after this came out it immediately went down 200 points because these are kind of uh, scary headlines but let's go ahead and and look into this to see if it's as scary as it seems or if maybe this is just kind of clickbait so the producer price index and measure what comes companies get from their products in the pipeline increased 0.3% from the month to 7.4% from a year ago. Seems scary. However, when you go down here and you look at this chart, you can see that 7.4% is like straight down from where it had been. And actually it's the lowest it's been since um, May of 2021. So we're, 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 we are headed down and this is good news. And incidentally that the PCE line, the, the core index that excludes food and energy is doing the same thing. It's kind of like going straight up like this and coming straight down. So you may see that that was up 6.2% from a year ago, but again, it's also coming down. Now we're going to hit the high points of this article so that we can kind of uh, project what we believe the inflation read is going to become this Tuesday. So services inflation accelerated for the month rising 0.4% after being up just 0.1% the previous month. So we may have to just up a little bit for services. One third of that gain came from the financial services industry, where prices surged 11.3%. That was offset somewhat by a sharp decline in passenger transportation costs, which fell 5.6%. So, you know, airline tickets are a little cheaper now than they had been, and that's, that's good. On the good side, the index rose just 0.1%, a steep decline from the 0.6% October gain. So where we were losing on services, we're actually doing better on goods. The modest gain came despite a 38% uh, increase in the price of vegetables. Now the prices moved higher across multiple food categories, even as the gasoline index tumbled 6%, and we all know that gas prices have been coming down. However, it's noted that this food increase is likely an anomaly and not necessarily reflecting a change in trend. We all know that commodity prices are coming down. Why would food be going up and oil be going down? You know, the machines that, that harvest this stuff, it, it's, it's getting cheaper. The release comes amid other signs that price increases were at least decelerating from a pace that had put inflation at its highest level in more than 40 years. 
A year ago, headline PPI rose 1% for the month and 10% on a 12-month basis. So now we're up 0.3% and we're 7.4% on a 12-month on a basis, and that's a whole lot better than it was one year ago. And that's exactly what it says right here. Keep in mind, compared to where we were a year ago, we are in a better place and headed in the right direction. Now, this is very important here for calculating the CPI. This was the third month in a row that headline PPI increased 0.3%. Third month in a row, the same exact PPI increase. And that's all we pretty much need from this article to kind of calculate the CPI. So like we said, the inflation data is supposed to come out on Tuesday, December 13th at 8.30 a.m., and what's expected is the annual inflation rate is expected to decline from 7.7% down to 7.6%. However, this consensus says it's going to be down to 7.3%. It could be that by Tuesday, this number is going to be much smaller, but for now it's 7.6%. And let's see if that's going to be accurate. Now, remember, we looked at um, the PPI and we saw that it was up 0.3% three months in a row. So the last two months that it's been up 0.3%, the CPI has been up 0.4%. So just using uh, logic, we could think that this month it's also going to be 0.4%. But let's dig into this a little bit more. We know that food was going to be uh, up a little bit more than it was last month because vegetables went up 38%. We know that energy is going to be coming down equal to what food goes up. It could be that this month's number, uh, last month they were all positive numbers, but it could be that this month's number is going to look closer to the way that it was here in September and things are going to be negative. Either way, it's expected that these two are going to balance out. We know that uh, that goods went down a lot and goods went down more than services went up so services less energy we would expect this number to go up but we would expect this number here to come down more than this number goes up so we're thinking that uh, used uh, used cars and trucks new vehicles apparel and so on are going to come down more than shelter transportation services and medical care expenses are going to go up as a matter of fact it was said that the transportation services actually came down it could be that our increase is going to be in medical care services and let's hope that it's not in shelter because shelter is 42 percent of the weighting of this index and you know that um rents have been coming down what four months in a row and we've actually had uh, the steepest decline in basically history for our housing prices the last four months on month over month declines and yet this number just continues to go up this is a lagging indicator eventually it'll come down not sure when maybe next summer but we know that our housing prices aren't going up month on month however this number just continues to rise that uh, nevertheless uh, services should tick up a little bit and goods should tick down a little bit so when we calculate this, we're going to do first 0.4% uh, month on month increase, and then we're going to do 0.3% because I think that that's actually going to be our number. So let's go ahead and look at this. So the way that we calculate this, uh, people that uh, watch these videos a lot know, know the way this is done, but just for those of you that are brand new to this channel, let's go ahead and do this real quick. We'll see that uh, in October, the number was 298.062. Plug that into the calculator. And you divide that by this number here, 276.590, and that gives you our month-on-month -month inflation, which was 7.7%. However, it should have probably been 7.8% because they generally speaking are going to round this up, but they put it down to 7.7%. Now, remember, the forecast for the next month is 7.6%. So what we do is we take this number here, 278.524, and when you multiply that, by 7.6% and you get 299.691 and you and then that's going to be the number that is projected that's going to be the new number so currently it's 298.062 and they're projecting 299.691 so if you divide uh, this number here 298.2062 then you're going to get a five point or point zero five four increase month over month. Now remember, uh, it's been point four, and they're saying it's going to be point five four. So that's a little bit more than what we're projecting. What we're projecting is going to be point four or point three. So when we go over here again, 
uh, we're going to say that it's not going to be 0.54. It's going to be a number less than that. So what we're saying is it's going to be 0.4 at the very least because the PPI has come in at 0.3 three months in a row. So let's go ahead and let's do this. We're going to multiply this number here, 298.062 times 1.004. And that gives you the 0.4 number. And then we're going to divide this number here, the new number, by our November number, which is 278.524. And divide that by 278.524. And that gets us 7.4%. Now, remember, the consensus was 7.3. Um, I'm thinking that it should probably be 7.4. But let's just see what happens if we multiply this number by 0.3. So let's see, 298.062. And this is actually the number I think it's going to be. Times 1.003. That equals 298.95. And you divide that by 278.524. And you get a year-on-year inflation increase of 7.3 percent and maybe that's where the consensus is coming from or this 7.3 is that we are expecting this to be a little bit less not 0.4 month over month but 0.3 and that will get us our 7.3 figure now if we get this number then the thing that we have to understand is that the put call ratio right now is the highest it's been in 100 years, right? So all these people are going to be on the wrong side of this. So what could happen this week is going to be a massive, massive short squeeze. And if you look at this here, look at this. Here's the great financial crisis. This was the put call ratio. COVID, this was the put call ratio. You have to go back 100 years to find it as high as it was last week. Now, it was over here in 1996 or something like that. It was pretty high. But last week, it was at a 100-year high. And because of this, we could expect a wicked move up in the, uh, in the stock market next week. Now, let's go ahead and keep all that information in our back pocket and talk about a Fed-engineered recession, or what some are now calling the Powell recession. And I'm not trying to fear monger or anything like that, but I'm just trying to use this information as a way that's going to help guide me through my investment choices for the coming future, like, like the next six months or so. So the markets are bracing for a Powell recession that could be coming soon. And again, I'm not trying to fear monger. It's just kind of helping me you know, guide myself through my investment decisions here. So we're gearing up for a for a Powell recession. The three month Treasury yield now sits some 86 basis points ahead of the 10 year, a level not seen at least since at least the early 1980s. And the reason why this is important is because here is a list of the Treasury yields. Now, this is what a lot of people call the short end or short duration treasuries, and this is what they call the long end. Banks. Uh, borrow money on the short end and they lend money at this rate so every time they borrow money at 4.5 percent or 4.7 percent and they lend it out to somebody at 3.5 percent banks are losing money so it gets a lot harder to to, to you know a, obtain a loan from a bank. So if you're trying to start a small business, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get a loan right now than it would have been if if these numbers were the opposite or what the way that they normally are. So this has a tendency to stall the economy. So um, the three month treasury yield now sits some 86 basis points ahead of the 10 year and and that's a problem because it basically crushes small business or at least uh, small business startups. In fact, the last time the disparity was this deep came when then Fed Chair Paul Volcker induced a recession to end the runaway inflation of the 1970s and early 1980s. It was over 10 years of inflation, so he decided he'd have to introduce these really extreme Fed policies in order to crack down on inflation. This inflation has only been going on for one year. Now, some investors fear current Chair Jerome Powell is doing the same. The last time we were here was at the start of the Volcker recession and his Fed was already cutting rates. 
the Powell uh, Fed is raising rates. Now, when he was doing this, he said, well, Bob, things are looking pretty bad. Things are pretty inverted. I guess we should probably cut rates. He was cutting them. We have an inversion that's the largest in, what, 40 years? And he's still raising rates. So this could cause a problem. Now we have a Fed that is still talking about higher for longer rates, the opposite of 1981's trajectory. Markets are essentially saying there will be another man-made economic contraction soon, the Powell recession. The New York Fed has a tracker on its site that gauges the possibility of a recession by the three-month, 10-year curve. As of the end of November, the inversion level implied a 38% recession chance within 12 months, according to the central bank's methodology. But as Colas pointed out, a 38% chance is as good as a 100% chance by historical trends. Every time the New York Fed indicator has topped the 30% probability, a recession is followed. So when you look at this thing, here's the 30% line. Every time it goes 30%, you get a recession. We're over here at 38, we're gonna get a recession. The Fed model is clearly saying high short-term interest rates are going to cause a recession in the next 12 months. Moreover, these odds are very likely to increase. That's at least in part because policymakers plan to keep raising interest rates. Now, this is one school of thought. However, you know, you do have your contrarians. You have people that are taking the other side in this argument. Most Wall Street firms are expecting a recession, though Goldman Sachs has said it still sees a path to a soft landing in which the central banks can engineer a pullback in inflation without tanking the economy. This is one school of thought, is that they could engineer a soft landing, and that is a possibility, and that's where Goldman Sachs lands. As a matter of fact, Jim Cramer over here, he's got his show over there on CNBC. He says the economy is stabilizing, and it, it can avoid a recession. So there are people out there that say that this can be done. Now, I'm going to be playing it from the the side that says that it can't be done and our landing is going to be vicious. It's going to be very, very hard. Capital economics projects the economy will slip into a mild recession next year with unemployment unemployment hitting around 5% from its current 3.7% level. Now, I'm of the belief that these higher interest rates are going to start crushing a lot of these uh, smaller industries. So, sort of like it, it kind of, it's like making Carvana here go bankrupt, it's, it, and it's probably open door. And other, other types of businesses that are far more interest rate sensitive, especially some of these new businesses that came on by a SPAC, or some of these newer IPOs, that depend on loans to keep their, their doors open. I feel that this is going to be, the dominoes are going to be set in place that they're not going to be able to stop at like 5%. It's like everything's happening so quickly. Supply chains open up, uh, inventory gets, is, is, it grows at a rapid pace. Semiconductors go from an, uh, old, a way shortage to now we have way too many of them. Everything's happening so uh, rapidly that I think that uh, unemployment rate's going to do something similar. It's not just going to stop at 5%. It's going to swing way over to one side, and they're going to force the cut rates and go way back to the other side to kind of fix this. And once these dominoes start falling, it's going to hard to put them back up again. And that's kind of where the way I see that the stock market's pricing this sort of thing in. Now, you might have heard that this, that that the bond market has it right, but the stock market has it wrong because the stock market hasn't quite tanked, though I would argue that it has. I mean, with the NASDAQ down over 30%, I would say that that is what I consider tanking. But anyway, they're saying that the bond market has it right with its inversion saying a recession is coming and the stock market has it wrong because they're saying it hasn't gone down far enough. So uh, David Katz on the recession where says, while the bond market might have it right, the stock market might have already priced in a recession is looking beyond the slowdown. And this is kind of where I sit. I'm saying that the bond market does have it right and the stock market has it right because the stock market looks at the Fed and says, hey, look, you have a dual mandate. It's price stability. It's max employment. And so we're saying that when, when this house of cards comes crumbling down and all the dominoes are falling down, you're going to have to cut rates to set these dominoes back up. Because so the analogy that I like to use is that basically uh, the house has got infest, uh, a termite infestation and you're going to have to burn down the house to get rid of all the termites. Well, the house is more important. Figure out another way to get rid of your termites. Call a better exterminator. And that's what I think that the 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 stock market is pricing in. It's pricing in uh, that it's looking past the recession and it's kind of saying, 
you're going to have to cut rates to undo this. You just can't continue in this way. And that's what the stock market is saying. And with all that as a backdrop, let's have a look at this video from Mike Wilson. Mike Wilson is guy, I mean, he's been right on the money for over a year. This is the guy I listen to now because if I had listened to him all along, I'd have a lot more money today. So let's go ahead and listen to this, a quick snip from Mike Wilson as he predicts his double digit percentage drop will hit stocks in early 2023. Our next guest sees a lot of two way risk in the market. Mike Wilson is Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. equity strategist and CIO. Mike, it's always good to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, two-way risk sounds to like markets up, markets down. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it's not getting any easier. Okay, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. I mean, this has been. I think the first half of this year was, I mean, fairly simple. If you just were bearish and kind of held that position, and then, you know, we've had two major, you know, tactical rallies since June. The first one, and then of course one in October. This one actually has better breath, which is kind of interesting. And so I do think we're closer to the end. I mean, we don't know when the Fed's going to pause. It's we think it's January. I think they do 50 in December, 25 in January, and that's it. Okay, that's ahead of where the market is. And the market's trying to pre-trade that, kind of like it did this summer. Now, we thought it was premature this summer to get in front of that. This time, we actually think there's validity to that. The question is, what are you going to pay for this thing if you think earnings are going to be really disappointing next year, which is our core view? So, you know, we're trying to have our cake and eat it, too. We like to do that, right? So we're, we're having a tactical rally now. I kind of agree with Steve. We're, we're, we probably got some, you know, upward bias into year end. But ultimately, the bear market's not over, and we got significantly lower lows if our earnings forecast is correct. Yeah, so 2023, your price targets are out. 3,600 is your bear case. 3,900 right. is the base, and 4,200 is the bull case. What's the rate expectation backdrop to these cases? Yeah, so, I mean, it's probably somewhere between 275.3 if it's a recession to, you know, maybe four and a quarter if there's a reacceleration in the back half of the year. I'd probably split the difference. I'd probably say it's three and a quarter, you know, something like that. I, I, look, to me, it's not about the year-end targets. It's about the path. Right? I mean, nobody cares about what's going to happen in 12 months. They, they need to deal with the next three to six months. And that's where we actually think there's significant downside. So while 3,900 sounds like, oh, that sounds like a really boring uh, six month. No, this is going to be challenging. It's a wild ride. It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> and it's going to be a lot to do. You know, the good, I'd say the best thing I can say is, hey, the breast's getting better. You know, the average stock is doing better than the index. And there's going to be probably stock opportunities going forward as opposed to just trading the index. So Mike Wilson's base case is that we're going to end up about 3,900 at the end of next year on the S&P. It's currently sitting about 3,900 right now. Dan Niles sees a last gasp rally between now and Christmas before things get ugly again in 2023. And this is exactly where I sit. I think this last gasp rally actually happens this week. And the catalyst is going to be the inflation read and the, the 50 basis point hike. So when we look at the S&P 500, this is kind of, I, I see a whole lot of this coming on. It's going to be a lot more of this. A, a long time ago, you know, I, I had my projections for what I thought the market was going to do, and I said it was going to be pretty flat for the foreseeable future. Um, it was going to be one of these things where it was going to go up a lot, it was going to go down a lot, but essentially it was going to be flat. And this is, again, what I see for the foreseeable future now. If you look back here on May uh, 11th and 12th, we're saying that the S&P was at 39.30, and it's still at 39.30. It's up four points since May 12th. And this is what I think is actually going to happen uh, for the next six months. And this is kind of what um, Mike Wilson was saying. It's going to be essentially flat, but man, is it ever going to be a wild ride? For this, uh, if we get this wild move up that I'm expecting in this week and that I think Dan Niles might be expecting, it might not be an awful time to go ahead and go ahead and cash out your money and uh, put it all into something like, say, a JEPI and just kind of wait out this rally. And in the meantime, it's going to end up flat over the next six months, but you're going to go ahead and make your 10.62%. Now, this is uh, this this thing pays out a monthly dividend. The monthly dividend looks like it's roughly right now going because of the volatility so high about 60 cents a share. So it's really, really nice. The, tr the shares are currently trading at 55. 55 and you could wait this out. JPI is going to go down. JPI is going to go up. And but what what, I, what I'm saying is that at the end of six months, the JPI in all likelihood uh, will end up at about the same price it is today as the S and P is about the same price it is today. However, you are going to have the benefit of picking up this nice dividend. A lot of the big banks are just kind of moving hardcore into these short duration fixed assets, you know, like bonds, you know, three month, six month, uh, and bonds. 
and they're going to collect about four and a half percent with this one here you can collect ten and a half percent so i would say this is a better option at least it's the one i would choose but it's not the one i'm going to choose <laughs> because if i do get this move straight up what i'm going to end up doing is i'm going to go 100 percent cash and i plan on being very active in the market over the next six months, you know, probably a lot more active than I am right now, even though I'm going to be 100% cash, I'm going to be trading options, I'm going to be taking advantage of some swing trades. And I'm sure I'll get like put some like if I sell puts, I'm going to be put some stocks, but I'll be swinging those as well. And I'll do that until the market, the S&P gets around, say, 3500 range. And when it gets down there, then then I'm going to start buying more and start going long a little bit more and trying to ride the market back up. And though it might be flat over the next year, I'm going to try and be a lot more tactical about this. And I'm going to try and like maximize my gains with the market by coming in with my long holdings at about S&P 3500 and buy more if it goes down more. Now, if the market doesn't get the squeeze that I'm expecting this week, or let's say the inflation rates higher than I'm expecting and actually the, the market goes down, then I'll just continue doing what I'm doing because in the end, that's fine too because I think that the market's actually going to trade pretty flat for the next six months. So at least I don't feel like I'm going to lose any money doing what I'm doing. As a matter of fact, the way that I trade, I'll end up making a little bit of money. It's just not going to be as much as if the market went up a lot this week. Now, let's have a look at my options trades for the past week. So if you look over last week, uh, from December 5th through December 9th, ended up making $252 last week in options. It's not really that much, but you know, um, extrapolate over a month, that's like $1,000. And so far this month, I'm up, let's see, about um, $771 in options. So, you know, over a month, it's like a thousand bucks. I'll probably make another $300 this month in options. But if we look over just uh, December 9th, here's a lesson to be learned. And so if we look at Lululemon, I had sold a put on Lululemon and, at, and they went on earnings from $374 all the way down to $326 today. So it was quite an epic crash right there. However, I had a sold put on Lululemon, but I really didn't lose that much money. And the reason I didn't lose that much money is I didn't stand to gain that much money. So uh, I would say in times like this, don't be particularly aggressive, especially around earnings, because uh, try and get little small gains. And you could probably say that this is true for most of the time. But uh, Lululemon only stood to make 86 bucks. I had a strike price on a sold put of $325, meaning that if it finished below $325, um, I would be on the hook to still buy 100 shares of Lululemon at $325. If it finished over $325, I'd get to keep their $86 and I don't have to buy the shares. I ended up losing $164 here. However, I did end up buying um, Lululemon shares and then making an extra $111 or so because I just I thought that the battle line was drawn on Lulu right around $325. $330. And so I bought some a little bit cheaper and, and it ended up finishing like 326 and I sold it before the end of the day and made a little bit of money there. So made up those losses. The place where I was kind of upset that I lost is I sold a covered call on NVIDIA at 175, ended up losing $84 on that one. And the reason why, okay, so with covered calls, if it finishes over 175, then I would have to uh, sell them at $175. Now, NVIDIA is known to just, I've, I've, had, I've owned it forever, and it just like squeezes straight upwards. And I, I've seen this thing just like, just go up $20 in a day, and I didn't know where it was going to end up. But the problem was I want NVIDIA for next week, because I think that that's when we're going to get our good squeeze, and I want those profits on NVIDIA. So I ended up losing $84. You know what? Who cares? Uh, I'm just hoping that I'm going to get a lot more money out of this next week. So that's going to do it for this week, folks. If you've got anything out of this video, yeah, please like, subscribe, hit that little notification bell. Until then, we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye. And now a word from my sponsor. Guys, have you ever bought a 12-pack of one of your favorite beers to give away at one of those Christmas gift exchanges at work, but then you tore into it before you had a chance to give it away? Man, I have. Mm. Merry Christmas to me, suckers. It looks like you're getting a candle. All right, and this beer here is Hershey's Porter. I love this. It's seasonal, it's rare, it doesn't come out very often, and I must give this beer five Kate Rooney's out of five. Have a great day, y'all.